Right. I think we'll, we'll get started, but there might be some more people coming in um, as we go on. And welcome to everyone who's joining us remotely through the live stream as well. And uh, look forward to more people joining us there as well as we get started. Um, so welcome everyone to this um, session on climate risk and tipping points in the polar regions. And we're here today in the Arctic Base Camp 10 at COP26. Um, so as you can see, maybe on the live stream and, and here in person, definitely the Arctic Base Camp 10 is an actual fieldwork tent from the uh, from well, used in the polar regions. Um, so that's why we're all a bit like squished together here in, <laughs> in a small space, but we're gonna, gonna make it work. And uh, you know, it's the full authentic polar experience. Um, so I wanna say a big thank you, first of all, of course, to Arctic Base Camp for hosting us and to Gail Whiteman, uh, the organizer of Arctic Base Camp for inviting us to, to run this event, um, which is very kind and the COP26 Universities Network um, also for, for supporting us with this work. Um, so my name is Eric Mackey. I'm an engagement manager at Cambridge Zero, which is the University of Cambridge's um, cross-disciplinary climate change initiative, working on all aspects of climate change research and education and, and decarbonization. And um, I'm really delighted to be here today and to um, welcome our exciting um, lineup of panelists for this session today. So I'll just introduce each of our panelists. Um, so our first speaker today will be Dr. Tamsin Edwards from King's College London. She's a, a reader in climate change at King's College and also a lead author on the um, IPCC six assessment report um, from Working Group One that came out in August on the um, oceans, cryosphere and sea level change chapter. So really looking forward to hearing from you soon, Tamsin. Um, our second panelist today is Professor Michael Bravo from the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge, um, who is... Um, a convener of circumpolar history at, um, at Cambridge and, and lectures in geography as well, I think. Um, so looking forward to hearing from you as well. And thanks for being here today. Um, our third panelist today is uh, Dr. Louise Syme from the um, British Antarctic Survey. She's a paleoclimate modeler and um, leader of the um, uh, ice dynamics and paleoclimate team. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> checking my notes there. And uh, finally, we have Gabby Kleber as well, who is a doctoral research student with us at University of Cambridge in the Department of Earth Sciences, working on, on methane in the Arctic, and really looking forward to hearing from you as well. So um, really glad that you're all here today. Uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about the structure of today's session and um, so that we all know what, what to expect. So we're going to hear from, I'm, I'm going to give a very brief introduction myself, but I'll keep that very short. And then we're going to hear from each of our panelists. They'll have... Um, about 10 minutes each to give an, an initial presentation about their work and uh, on the topic. And then that'll be, so that'll make up the first half of today's session. And then the second half is, is fully devoted to um, discussion and question and answers uh, from the audience. And we'll be able to take questions from the audience live here in the room, but also from um, the remote audience through Zoom. So you will be able to ask questions through the, the Q&A function on the Zoom webinar and um, hopefully that will all work with the technology, but I think we've got it all set up and running. And so do please keep your questions till after each of the panelists has given their presentation so that we um, will we'll go for each of the presentations first and then we'll do all the questions after that. Um, okay, yes. go to the slide here. Right, so I think that was all I needed to say in terms of housekeeping. So. In terms of the topic for today, so we're, we're, we're talking about climate risk and tipping points in the polar region specifically for, for today's session. Um, so I wanted to start just by giving a few definitions from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, on what we mean when we talk about risk, climate risk and, and tipping points. So um, the definition for, for risk in the IPCC is the, the potential for adverse consequences for human or ecological systems recognizing the diversity of values and objectives associated with such systems. And in the context of climate change, risks can arise from potential impacts of climate change as well as the human response to climate change. So I think that's a really important way to think about risk. It's not just the impacts from the physical impacts of climate change, but also the human responses to climate change. And we'll be discussing that human element of uh, climate risk and tipping points in today's session as well. Um, and then that brings me on to what is a tipping point. So a tipping point by the IPCC definition is a critical threshold beyond which a system reorganizes often abruptly and or irreversibly. Um, so in the context of the climate system, there are many 
potential tipping elements in the climate system. Tipping element is a part of the climate system that could pass a, a tipping point. And um, so we'll, we'll be discussing several of those in the context of the polar regions. Um, and I think a, a key part of that definition to think about here as well as the, the abrupt and irreversibility parts and whether or not we can, we can you know, define whether that such an abrupt um, response might happen and when it might happen and whether or not that response is actually irreversible or not. And I think this is a, something that will come up in, in, in several of the presentations this morning. So um, I just wanted to highlight that. And then finally, I just also on the slide there have put this um, a statement actually from the IPCC summary for policymakers uh, that came out with the six assessment report just uh, in, now in August. So they actually state in the IPCC that abrupt responses and tipping points of the climate system, such as strongly increased Antarctic ice sheet melt or forest dieback, cannot be ruled out. And they have high confidence in that statement. So there is a lot of uncertainty around tipping points, but we definitely cannot rule them out. And I think that's a really important point that we need to really understand um, what they are and what the uncertainties associated with them are and, and how we can kind of prepare for these, these potential events. Right. Now, I just have one more slide here. Um, this is a, um, just a, a map of potential Earth system tipping elements that, that could occur at different levels of global warming or maybe triggered at different levels of global warming. So you can see this includes things like as we already mentioned, um, collapse of the West Antarctic or Greenland ice sheets, which Tamsin will be talking about, uh, but also there's the Arctic sea ice is in there, um, methane release from permafrost melt in the Arctic as well, but there are also tipping points not associated with the polar regions, like the Amazon rainforest, there are tipping points associated with that, there are tipping points associated with shifting monsoon systems in India and, and other parts of the world. And so, we, you know, there are lots of these tipping points that could occur, and there are also actually connections between these different tipping points. And you could actually, and we could end up with like cascading connections between tipping points around the world. Now, I don't know how much we'll go into that today, but we'll be focusing mostly on those polar region tipping points for, for today's session. Um, yes. Oh, and one more thing I just wanted to highlight here as well, that this, um, this event and is, is kind of part of a wider project from the COP26 Universities Network, which is a, a group of universities all across the UK kind of working together to raise the voice of universities at COP26 and, and enhance our you know, collective um, um, action at COP26. And as part of the um, COP26 Universities Network, we've been running this climate risk project and I'm one of the, the fellows working on that project. And um, uh, we ran, for example, we ran a climate risk summit a month ago where we brought together lots of risk researchers and, and practitioners working on climate risk. And we've also produced this climate risk communication toolkit, with, of which this is actually a, um, uh, one of the figures from that toolkit. So, um, which is, and this toolkit is all about how we communicate around climate risk. Um, so just wanted to highlight that as well. And I actually have a couple of physical copies of it with me if anyone would like one, but we also, it's also freely available online and I'll, I'll share the link to that as well. Okay. Um, so I think that was all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Tamsin, our first speaker, and um, she'll be talking about the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. So over to you, Tamsin. And it's just the, the enter button there. Uh, thanks, Eric, for the really nice introduction um, and for asking me to speak today. I'll go a little closer to the mic there. Um, so, yeah, I'll talk about the uh, Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, particularly with sort of the assessment that we did uh, in the sex assessment report for the IPCC back in August, which, which Eric mentioned. Um, so I'll, st I'll start uh, with an introduction to Greenland up in the north. Uh, so obviously in the Arctic, um, a nice uh, volume sort of equivalent to about seven meters of sea level rise. And, and particularly vulnerable because the Arctic is warming so much faster than the rest of the world, more than uh, double the rate of, of average global warming. Um, and uh, so we have a, an assessment for the 21st century uh, that continued ice loss is virtually certain for the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, of course, it's been losing mass actually at a, at a faster and faster rate over the satellite period of the last few decades. Um, and, a, and a high confidence that that ice loss increases with our cumulative uh, emissions. So the more greenhouse gases we emit, the more ice it will lose. Um, and this map here shows the uh, 
the predicted thinning of the ice sheet under very high greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2100. So you can see around the margins is particularly vulnerable uh, in the sort of brownish region, uh, sort of colors there. Moving to the other end of the planet for the Antarctic, um, and particularly focusing uh, on the region of concern, the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, which is over three meters of sea level equivalent. Um, we have a, an assessment um, from the IPCC this century that continued ice loss is likely. So you'll notice that's a sort of a weaker statement than for Greenland. And that's mainly because it's unclear how much the increasing snowfall in a warmer climate, which occurs particularly over the sort of East Antarctic and, and interior regions will offset to some extent the ice loss that we expect around the coasts, particularly from um, warmer ocean temperatures. And so this map here again shows the predicted thinning under very high greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2100. And you can see, for example, uh, particularly strongly the Thwaites Glacier losing ice here and uh, the Totten in that, and that's a West Antarctica and the Totten Glacier in East Antarctica. Uh, but there is uh, what we called, um, and this, this term was first coined in the special report on the oceans and cryosphere in, in sea level change um, in 2019, deep, deep, there is deep uncertainty uh, about about the ice sheets, and particularly Antarctica, and that uncertainty increases with higher and higher greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so, one way that we uh, approach this sort of uncertainty was to come up with um, well, across the report, there's this term low likelihood, high impact uh, outcomes or storylines. Um, and these are are basically things where the probability is either low or unknown. Uh, but would have serious impacts, essentially. And so, so for the uh, ice sheets, um, uh, we included a storyline under which uh, we had very high greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also extreme melting of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet uh, and an unstable Antarctic ice sheet. And so that sort of low likelihood, high impact storyline was uh, uh, basically had um, estimates of over half a meter sea level contribution from both from each ice sheet just this century. And this is uh, a graph from the summary for policymakers uh, showing the sea level projections this century. So going from 1950 to 2100. Um, and and what it shows is uh, the sort of the main colored uh, sort of lines at the bottom of the main projections up to 2100 under a range of different emission scenarios. And those go between about 30 centimeters and a meter of sea level uh, of sea level rise. This is the total sea level rise now, just not just the ice sheets. This is also including the expansion of the oceans um, from warming, the, what we call the thermal expansion and also the contribution from mountain glaciers um, and, uh, and other glaciers around the world. But what we can also see on here is a dash line, uh, which is this low likelihood, high impact storyline under the very high greenhouse gas emissions, the highest of the five here, um, and including those ice sheet sort of extreme end of things in terms of melting and instability. And, uh, and that starts to approach two meters of sea level rise this century. But there is limited evidence for this. So this is basically um, uh, based on um, expert judgment, so a sort of survey of experts, and, uh, and also a single model that predicts a particular rapid instability for Antarctica, which if you're, if you're interested in that or familiar with it, I'm going to go into it, but it's called marine ice cliff instability. So here are some ice cliffs. This is actually Thwaites Glacier that I mentioned earlier. Um, and and it's, in fact, it's not the only instability for Antarctica, but it's the one that's got a lot of attention in recent years. It's the idea of these ice cliffs collapsing very rapidly into the ocean. Um, and so that's a much faster process than glaciers flowing into the ocean. And the idea is that that could happen after a floating ice shelf, which is sort of extending into the ocean, um, disintegrates through the air uh, temperatures warming. 
um, and leaving behind this kind of vertical cliff, which because it's tall is unstable, uh, it then collapses, it's just not mechanically strong enough. And of course the ice behind that would still be a cliff potentially that could collapse as well. And so you could lead to a sort of domino effect of rapid ice loss. Um, it is very uncertain um, the kind of conditions under which this might occur and how much it might keep going and propagating because it is quite dependent on the local conditions and it's quite a difficult process to actually understand and to include in our models. So as I say, there's just this one study, uh, this one model, sorry, um, that makes predictions of this particular rapid instability. So as I say, it's called the Marine Ice Cliff Instability. And it, was, and it was part of this kind of low likelihood, high impact storyline that I mentioned for the 21st century, but also now we can look at the longer term. So this graph here now, we're starting to look out to the year 2300. The little graph down at the bottom is the one I just showed for the 21st century. Now on the same scale, we've got here the projections of total sea level rise in the year 2300 for two different scenarios, very high greenhouse gas emissions and low. And you can see there's a huge range of possible futures here. We, uh, if we keep warming down to about one and a half to two degrees uh, for that whole period, then we might limit sea level rise to the low, the blue bar, which is sort of between around half a meter and three meters of sea level rise, still enough to change coastlines around the world. Uh, but there is um, some, some sort of limiting of sea level rise there. But if we had sort of un, unmitigated sort of um, continuing increases of greenhouse gas emissions through that whole period, uh, so up to the year 2300, that very high emission scenario, then you can see that goes up to seven meters of sea level rise. So really very huge. And the, the, the higher our emissions, uh, crucially, the more, we, more likely it is that we make the Antarctic ice sheet unstable. And what you might have noticed is the little red arrow uh, on the top there. And in the summary for policymakers, it says that we cannot rule out uh, more than 15 meters of sea level rise. So off the scale here, this scale goes up to about nine meters. And again, this is specifically the predictions under this rapid instability. So this marine ice cliff instability that I mentioned and this uh, map here is just one example under that instability if we had warming of three degrees. So that's uh, sort of in between these two scenarios, um, probably a bit at the lower end. This shows the kind of uh, ice losses that we could see under that instability. But um, actually, if, uh, if up at the very high emissions end, then it would be much, much more than this. It would be, um, I think if I remember rightly, up to 10 times more ice loss than this. Um, from Antarctica alone. So now let's look at the even longer time periods and more sort of a couple of uh, thousand years. Uh, and we'll look, look at both ice sheets. Um, so the assessment was that basically the probability of, of complete loss of the Greenland ice sheet and of the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, so that's a total of around 10 meters of sea level equivalent, over millennia, so over thousands of years, uh, increases with higher temperatures. Um, and so the kinds of numbers that we, that we are talking about are shown here. So for one and a half degrees of warming, if, if, our, um, if we have a sustained warming of one and a half uh, degrees, then that's sort of similar to the last interglacial period, which was 125,000 years ago. Uh, and here are some ice sheet um, reconstructions of that time uh, showing large losses from Greenland um, and from West Antarctica and the projections for the total sea level rise are sort of two to three meters um, and then up to about six meters at two degrees. So for sort of one and a half to two degrees the assessment is that the ice sheets will lose mass, they'll continue to, to shrink, but they won't fully disintegrate over a few centuries. Um, if there were large losses, it would be over thousands of years of, of sustaining temperatures at those levels. But looking at the higher uh, temperatures here, so between three and five degrees, so three degrees is similar to the mid Pliocene warm period three million years ago, and you can see here reconstructions where the much of the Greenland ice sheet is lost here, 
uh, much of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Potentially there could be parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet as well. Um, and the sea level equivalent would be up to 10 meters or 16 meters at four degrees. Um, and so, so the statement was for between three and five degrees of sustained warming, the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheet will be nearly completely lost over multiple millennia and perhaps also parts of East Antarctica. Um, but you'll notice that I, I wasn't really talking about thresholds in that sense, in terms of the temperatures. So sort of thinking about this question that Eric talked about of what is a tipping element. We didn't, uh, we didn't find a clear threshold in temperature, in global temperature, for loss of the Greenland ice sheet or West Antarctic ice sheets, uh, let alone parts of East Antarctica. And, and really, I think we're moving much more towards thinking about, cri yes, critical thresholds. Remember, tipping elements and tipping points um, are about critical thresholds. But for us, the, the clearer thresholds in the literature are more around the actual physical ice sheets itself. So there's, there's new studies that show, for example, if you, if you lose, um, off the top of my head, I think it's about half of the Greenland ice sheet, then it becomes uh, likely to, it's a sort of critical threshold beyond which it's very likely to lose more and hard to regrow. And similarly for Antarctica, not just the ice sheet size, but specifically if you lose specific ice shelves. So we've already lost some, but particularly the really big ones, the Ross and the Ronnie Filchner are the two huge ice shelves in Antarctica. So if we lose particular ice shelves or particular glaciers where you lose ice, the different kind of gaps in the ice sheet sort of join up and create a sort of critical point in the ice sheet size there. The location of the grounding line, where it is on the sort of bedrock uh, and what shape that bedrock is. And, and also the ocean temperatures, which don't necessarily scale exactly with global air temperatures. Um, they can be warming faster or slower than that. So that's another aspect to consider. So that's why I want to sort of emphasize that the ice sheets, we think there are critical thresholds, but we don't necessarily um, think or necessarily know enough to put a specific global temperature on those. But of course, that doesn't mean that's not important. And in fact, if anything, it's uh, more important to understand these because we don't know what the critical threshold in global temperature would be. We only know that the warmer it is, and also the longer we sustain that warming, that's a really critical thing for the ice sheets, the more likely it is that we lose uh, large parts of those ice sheets. And also considering those two other aspects that Eric mentioned of the speed and the irreversibility, this, this is taken from a table in chapter four on um, tipping points, uh, potential tipping points. Uh, certainly for West Antarctica, there is this potential for abrupt, abrupt change from this marine ice cliff instability, but also for both ice sheets, um, the losses would be irreversible for sort of decades, centuries, millennia. Um, and so therefore sea level rise, of course, would remain high. So I think that's all I, I, I really wanted to say, just to sort of try and unpack uh, critical thresholds and tipping elements for the ice sheets. Clearly very important, but very unclear what the global temperature thresholds would be for those. Thanks. Great. Oh. Thank you very much, Tamsin, for that um, great presentation and introduction to the, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And I think for highlighting some of the, the very sobering figures of the kind of amount of sea level rise that we, you know, will be looking at in the in the next hundred, few hundred years with certain levels of warming, but also for highlighting the, the the deep uncertainty associated with these things, which makes it as well really hard to like plan and prepare for these kind of events, which I think is a really, really key point. And and also your point that the longer the longer it keeps going and the longer we sustain the warming is a really um, key aspect in this. So thank you. Time. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to our next speaker. So our next speaker, and, and I, I should maybe repeat for people in the remote audience as well, that we'll keep um, we'll, all your questions, please keep your questions till the end of all the panelists having done their presentations, and we'll do all the questions at the end. So rather than doing questions in between uh, presentations, if that's okay. Um, we'll have lots of time for questions. <laughs> um, so our next speaker today is Professor Michael Bravo from the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. And um, I'll hand over to you. I'll get your slide up. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much. Working. Okay. So, yeah. Is the mic on? Yep. Uh, 
look, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak with this uh, panel and to join in this Arctic Base Camp event. Uh, it's, uh, is that good? Because it's complex. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So to understand these risk constellations is essentially to recognize the complexity of the Arctic and the diversity of it. Well, what do we mean by that? We're fortunate to have a, a couple of uh, good maps here. So on the right hand side, I, I love this map because one of the things that it shows is the, um, it's a map of the languages of the Arctic, of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. And we don't see this often enough. And it shows us in a glimpse, really how much cultural diversity and complexity there is, okay? It also shows us secondly, how inhabited, how populated this region is. This is no empty region. This is no terra incognita. This is a place where people have lived and moved and had sophisticated cultures for centuries and indeed millennia. So that's what I wanted to capture with the image on the right. And then uh, the image on the left we'll come back to looks rather similar. It's also a circumpolar projection, isn't it? And uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, a demography map. It shows the concentrations uh, or the population, indigenous populations, where they are a uh, higher percentage of the total population. So in the darker regions like Nunavut and Greenland, where you have Inuit and Kalalet, Nunat and Greenland, you know, very strong indigenous population. Same also in the Saka Republic. So can we think about climate change at the same time? Can we think about the fires that have been burning in Siberia this year in regions where the indigenous population in the Saka Republic are really strong and important? Uh, we can think about the melting sea ice in the archipelago of Northern Canada. Again, very strong traditional knowledge base from the Inuit. So that was the kind of the first way we wanted to paint the picture. If we're going to get a sense of risk, we have to have this understanding that this is an inhabited region. And that's before, of course, we acknowledge the uh, fact that it's inhabited by animals and marine populations. So, so we can also be misled to thinking that people just, it's inhabited along the rim of the Arctic. But in fact, the, uh, the full Arctic is fully inhabited by different kinds of living beings, human and non-human. Okay. So that's, that's where I want to start from. The, the next point, I suppose, is to think about leadership. Okay. And that is what um, COP, I guess, in, in many respects is about. And I was very taken by something uh, that uh, Secretary John Kerry said at an Arctic Circle conference two years ago. And he said, you know, there are many scientific cha challenges, there are technological challenges which haven't been solved, but he was confident they could be. And I think he was right when he said that the biggest challenge to the climate emergency is good governance. He said governance, the, the strength of governance around the world is highly varied and actually our capacity. So when we try and think what's going on in COP this week, uh, it's an excellent way to think about what good governance might look like. I think that's being discussed right across the COP meetings. Okay. When we look at a circumpolar map like this, I mean, we've moved to a globalized Arctic. 
there's a longer discussion that there have been commodity cycles in the Arctic for hundreds of years, but in, but in some way in the last 10 or 20 years, the Arctic has moved up the geopolitical agenda in a new way. So one of the things that makes it so interesting to study, of course, is you have uh, liberal democracies in North America, social democracies, I mean, to put it simply, in Scandinavia, you have the, the Russian, formerly Soviet, uh, political economy of, of the Arctic. So there you had the world's most powerful nations with an interest in the Arctic. And that hasn't diminished since the old end of the Cold War. Now China, Japan, India, all very serious about what's going on in the Arctic. So again, in, in, in building up a layered approach to thinking about risk and human response, we also have to try and understand what it means for this region to be on the radar, on the map of all of these nations that, um, that we reckon have to come to some kind of an understanding and agreement to cooperate and collaborate to solve the climate problem. Okay? So the Arctic is really good to think with, as long as we're not too intimidated by the complexity of it. Okay. Next point then, coming back to Northern leadership. And this is also very important. I've been so delighted. One of, the, one of the outcomes, I think, of this COP is to an extent we haven't seen before is that indigenous partnerships, the role of indigenous people all over the world has been highlighted at this COP in a way we haven't seen before. We might wonder why. Why is it taken until now? But never mind. It's recognized that indigenous peoples, whether in the Amazon or the Arctic, are allies. They are also more than allies. They're the inhabitants. And therefore, it's really pretty important that in thinking about risk, we try and also reflect on what indigenous leadership looks like and what it contributes. So as a, you know, as a student many years ago, I was immensely impressed, actually. I mean, going back to the early 1990s, that, that Inuit leaders like C. Lawat Cloutier, who was nominated at the same time as Al Gore for the Nobel Peace Prize for, for her work, back in the 1990s was uh, attending events like like COP um, and uh, arguing forcefully for the need for concerted action on climate change. So indigenous leadership doesn't come new to this problem. It's quite a long history of it. The next point, of course, which really uh, is important in thinking about these partnerships and collaboration is that indigenous people have to be uh, acknowledged as, as having the right to speak for themselves. So it's really important that I, when I stand up here that I'm not pretending to speak for uh, indigenous peoples and, and I have to be careful not to do that, okay? And there's a good reason. Of course, they are, many of them are here at COP. They can speak for themselves and it's really important that self-representation is respected. But I can express both my admiration and as a scholar and a social scientist to assess and observe the kinds of statements that, they're, that they are making. So the point I think I, I want to get across here is that these collaborations with Northern peoples um, are a resource and an opportunity that have been recognized for some time. But one of the things that's come out in COP is that the, the resources, the funding hasn't been there for the partnerships to the extent that they could be. And in a way it's an open goal. If we want to fund these partnerships better, then uh, I think what's there to stop us, okay? If we look uh, back at the map on the left, the last aspect I want to sort of embellish my account with is about demography. So while um, I've had the, the good fortune to spend a lot of time with indigenous elders, which is just an extraordinary experience because you, you know, you are, you hear, um, you hear the experience of uh, many generations um, expert knowledge on whether it's on sea ice or traditional law or customs. But in any case, while traditional knowledge of the elders is extremely important, the map is also showing us something that's harder to grapple with, okay? Really hard to grapple with, but surely we're thinking about it already at COP. And that is that the demography of the Arctic is that it is full of young people. The population demography is much higher population of young people in Greenland and Nunavut. So 
while in a way it's not so convenient, we have to try and think about what kinds of conversations can involve young people, okay? And what we think we're doing when we want to collaborate with them. And I think that's, you know, an interesting and tricky question. Just a quick uh, um, nod or acknowledgement. One of the things that young people do is they uh, certainly turn to the arts and music and theater and song and film to put across uh, very sophisticated, powerful messages. So that's, so I think we have to think a lot about the kinds of conversations that we try and curate that go with these partnerships. Okay, so that's really my main point. Finally, I think I want to finish by saying that, again, it's fascinating for us to be one, of, one event and an important event in the middle of this, this uh, constellation of events called COP. And one of the things that we see, the other thing that resonates between Arctic Base Camp, these maps and COP is young people. And the press are obviously very taken by, uh, the, by the power of not just Greta Thunberg, but also, you know, people up and down the land, young people traveling, expressing uh, strong, powerful views about climate change. And of course, their views cannot be easily tamed. So we have both, we're used to thinking about, um, we're used to thinking about expertise as being sort of the inner core of, of driving climate change action. And then we have these sort of fringe, uh, fringe events um, where young people on the outside uh, have, have you know, come to express their views. And maybe, I, I think I'll leave it there, but just to say that this is something probably we also need to think hard about because I think in the wake of the COVID pandemic, one of the things that's shown us is that the notion of community isn't actually a sideshow for the big negotiations amongst political elites. And I don't, I don't use this uh, uh, and advisedly, but actually um, the notion of community COVID has shown us is actually at the heart of politics as well. So I think there's some interesting and unresolved puzzles they impact on our understanding of risk. And one of the most pressing issues is to understand actually, for real, how community shapes the various kinds of risk that we have to, we have to manage. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And that was really, really interesting uh, presentation. Thank you for highlighting this rich diversity of the, um, of the people in the Arctic and their different um, different languages and different backgrounds and what they can bring as part of this globalized Arctic. And also the um, really, I'm very glad that you highlighted the young people in the Arctic and their, their presence here at COP, which I think is a really important part of COP. You know, we've seen the young demonstrators out on the streets on Friday and Saturday. And, and I really think we need to make sure that their voices are heard. So I'm very glad you, you highlighted that as part of this. Um, okay, so. Right, so our next speaker today is um, Dr. Louise Syme from the British Antarctic Survey, and um, you're going to come and stand here. Yeah, so I'll get your slides up. There you go. <laughs> okay, good morning. Um, Thank you for the invite and for the nice introduction as well. So yeah, I'm Louise I'm at the British Antarctic Survey and my team, they um, work both with ice core data and they also run climate models. Um, I would argue it's quite a nice place to be in when we're thinking about um, tipping events and such like. We, we only have at the moment about just a bit more than a hundred years of good historic data, which shows climate change. So when we want to think about really um, abrupt, uh, yeah, abrupt climate change and tipping points, then looking at the past and particularly using ice cores is a really nice way to do this. So I'll show you a tiny bit of data from ice cores and then I'll, I'll show you some examples of actual tipping events in the past, uh, mostly with a focus on sea ice. And then we'll come a little bit to, to what's happening for the present day and how we can use some information from the past and from our climate models to say something about that. So this is some ice core data uh, from Antarctica and from Greenland. It shows some of the main measures that we look at, which are actually water isotope data. 
So from Antarctica, it's showing from the period that Tamsin's talked about for the last interglacial on this side, which is a past warm period. But what I was just going to talk to you about briefly um, before we get on to that is the period sort of in between. So time is running, I'm afraid uh, past climate people tend to, to mix their graphs. Out. But this, this one goes from this side to this side and time. So if you look at the Greenland um, record down below, then you'll see that looks incredibly kind of fuzzy. And what that's actually showing us, us is, uh, going forwards, backwards. Okay, that's fine. Oh, uh, conveniently I have, no, that's fine. It's fine as it is. No, no. I'm fine. <laughs> this one we've conveniently reversed the axes again, just to, just to keep you on your toes. And I've put Greenland on the top. As well. So the events which are numbered from 20 to 1 are all repeated examples of really large scale abrupt climate change. They're called DO events. And we know this has happened at least 20, well actually more than 20 times in this period. It was when the, the climate was really cold. And what's happening is that the, the record of water isotopes in the top is showing us that temperature was jumping up in Greenland by as much as up to 16 degrees over only probably well, probably less than one year. It's quite hard from the ice core records to be sure precisely of the timing, but it's certainly less than two years. And I just left the one in below just to say that the ice sheets are doing stuff at the same time. So we think these, these events down below, which are, um, are probably melt events from, from Greenland and Northern Hemisphere ice sheets are to do with this. So these events happened. They were enormous. They were very abrupt. And the, these are one of the main reasons that people worry about sea ice as being like a potential tipping event. But they also give us the ability to um, say, uh, ask questions of our climate models. We use these climate models to actually tell us about what's going to happen in the future to, to produce our um, climate projections. So I was just going to talk very briefly just to say, because we have these repeated examples of these events, can our climate models accurately simulate these? If they can, then it says we should at least have a, a degree more confidence in them in terms of like abrupt climate change for the future. So what we find when we look at the models is that to be able to capture these events correctly, you need both um, really slow feedbacks in the system from the oceans, but then also what happens to the sea ice is also really crucial. So you need both slow and fast feedbacks in the systems to have these big abrupt um, uh, climate oscillations happen. And if we ask, do our models adequately represent these processes? The answer is only some of them. So um, we're at the point that some of this research is quite new at the moment. So we know that some models can do this, but not all. What they kind of need to be able to capture accurately is the growth of sea ice over a long time period in a slow climate. That's what that sort of top panel is trying to say. And then once, once you have thick sea ice in the north, then you can have the build up of some heat uh, underneath that sea ice slowly over the course of a few thousand years. And then at some point we reach a tipping point where there's enough heat in the ocean and then that, that heat effectively mixes upwards and you have a massive melt back of the sea ice and then you're in a new state. So this is really a truly um, a tipping point and a tipping event because it's it's non-reversible over at least a few thousand years. That said, this type of tipping event can only occur in cold climates. So it's not something that we're actually concerned about for, for the future. Um, uh, one of my favourite one of my favourite time periods is the last interglacial. So I'll just talk very briefly as well about an example. It's not so much a tipping point, but more about sea ice loss in the Arctic during past warm climates. And again, a bit how we can use it to test our climate models. So at this period between about 125 to 130,000 uh, 130, years ago, um, we had a big warm period, which was particularly prominent both in Antarctic and actually also uh, also in the Arctic, but at a slightly different time. So we, we're fairly sure that in the Arctic, at least, what was going on was um, that 
uh, do I have a picture of it? I don't have a picture of it. The, there was a lot more um, solar insulation. So the, the orbit of the Earth was in a slightly different configuration to how it is now. And what that meant was basically there's a lot more sunshine in springtime. So it's relatively easy actually to set our models up for this. All we really need to do is change a little bit how we have the sunshine coming in at the top, top of the atmosphere. And if we do this, at least with the UK model, this is work that my group did recently, then what we find is that we have a complete loss of sea ice in the summer in September. I quite like this because I think this is the first time I got in a high profile journal, an example of a plot which was completely empty as a main result. So the September plot on the left is completely empty. There's no sea ice. So it means that, that this model in particular is showing that we have no sea ice this time period, which is interesting. We think it's the last time this happened. And when we, we check this again, observations, that all the little dots there are showing different places where we've collected pollen or ice core results. And we've got some indication of what the temperature was. And we test that against what, we, what our model gives us. We get a really good match. So because of that, we think that the model actually is for the first time, at least for the UK model, ca capturing the sea ice process correctly. And the reason for that is this version of the model, so models do get better through time, it has a better um, representation of melt ponds on sea ice. So because there was more sunshine in the spring, then you have more forcing, you have earlier onset of sea ice melt, albedo feedbacks, which I think is a bit of like feedbacks that everyone understands though, isn't it? So you have more um, uh, sea ice loss in uh, spring and summer, and that can result in a sort of runaway effect, but only on the course of like uh, a year effectively. So you get a complete loss of the summer um, sea ice in a five degree warmer Arctic. So does that have any um, implications for, for present or future? Well, I guess I can at least have to show you at least one plot of the, what the sea ice is doing right now. Well, we do, we do know that, that what's happening in the Arctic uh, is the, it's one of the, the regions with largest changes and a lot of that is to do with the sea ice. So compared with the, the previous period, um, at least uh, in the 1980 to 1910, um, median, then we've had a loss in summertime of between 40 to 50 percent sea ice it's in the maximum loss years. But it is worth saying that, that sea ice um, is a very variable, um, like it, there's a lot of interannual variability, so each year looks rather different from the last one. So you can see that like for, for the years here, um, well 2012 was the lowest, um, 2020 was also very low, but then there's been, been other things happening in between. The models through time, however, have tended to predict that we're more likely to have an earlier loss. Uh, well, if we're, we're on a sort of business as usual type scenario for emissions, that we are probably more likely to have an earlier sea loss than in previous previous generations of models. So I think this is the last plot I'm going to show you, don't worry, no more plots after this. But what this is trying to say is that, um, so under, uh, for this IPCC report, which was formed from output from the couple model into comparison six uh, results, then we have a, a date for uh, the ice-free Arctic for, for at least models which capture what happened in last warm period, which could be as early as um, 2038. And that's quite a lot earlier than at least um, the average uh, for previous generations of the models. And uh, at least from, from my perspective as a sort of paleoclimate modeler, I have a little bit more trust in the models which actually do a good job for past warm periods and which capture changes uh, that we see in the observational record. And that that tendency, there's, there's huge spread basically between the models, but that tendency for there to be a, 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 a more likely earlier loss of Arctic sea ice has also gone hand in hand with this measure, equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is um, about how much the, the world will warm up for a doubling of CO2. So I think that was where I was going to more or less end. Um, so I would say there's been lots of really interesting stuff done in the last years. Um, people are starting to realize how interesting tipping points are and how hard they are to study. It's kind of good for people who are interested in paleoclimate because when you go back in time, you, you, like I say, you, you can look, you can see some things that um, otherwise you can only 
yeah, you can only predict for the future, but without data to, to, to test against. So I would say at least for warm climates, some current models do adequately capture Arctic sea ice processes. Um, again, those same models support a somewhat earlier ice-free Arctic if we continue on um, a high mission scenario. But um, whilst in the past, uh, sea ice has been part of, um, I would say, irreversible climate change, at least over thousands of years. For the, the, the current period and for the future, um, it probably is not really a tipping point, actually, just, just the sea ice. It can be part of a, um, a system of cascades and, and other things which are going on in the Arctic and beyond that. But the reason for that is that actually we've done a lot, there's been lots of model simulations done where just the sea ice, if you reduce the carbon, um, then actually the, what those little plots there on the right are trying to show is there's not a lot of difference between what happens if you, you increase CO2 or you reduce it. You tend to actually have more or less the same amount of sea ice. So in that sense, it's a good news story. If carbon is reduced fast enough and if we are in a low emission zone, we might we could just avoid going fully sea ice free. I think that was all I wanted to say. Great, thank you so much, Louise, for um, highlighting the um, well, what we know about the sea ice in the Arctic and what we can learn from the um, paleo evidence from what has happened to sea ice in the past and whether or not we are or well, when we might be heading for an ice-free Arctic and, what, and how we can improve our models to, to predict that through learning from, from, from past changes. And interesting as well, how you know, highlighted that it might actually not be a tipping point, the sea ice. And a really important point there, I think that we can still save the sea ice in the Arctic in that sense if we re reduce our emissions quickly enough, which I think is obviously what COP26 is all about. Um, right. I just want to say before we move on to our next speaker to, to the audience um, remotely that please do start writing the, the questions that you're thinking of as, as we're having these discussions. Uh, please do start writing your questions in the Q&A window on Zoom and then when we get to, uh, to the end of all our initial presentations we can start answering your questions. So please use the Q&A window rather than the chat window for that because it's a bit easier for us to keep track of the questions coming in uh, that way. So um, our next speaker is Gabby Kleber from the um, Department of Earth Sciences in Cambridge and she'll be speaking on, on methane in the Arctic. So over to you, Gavin. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, I'm Gabby Cleaver. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Earth Sciences uh, at the University of Cambridge. And my work focuses on looking at some terrestrial methane emissions in the high Arctic. So I'll get a, a bit of background on methane, just to put it in context in terms of global warming. Um, methane is considered the second most important greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide. And actually, um, it's contributed about 30% of the warming that we've, we've seen due to um, greenhouse gas emissions. And despite the fact that it has way less, there's way less methane in the atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide, um, the reason this is is because it's a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide so it it's much more efficient at um, absorbing and trapping heat and keeping it in our atmosphere so our current um, atmospheric concentrations of methane are about two and a half times that of what they were um, before the onset of industry so before the year of 1750. And as you can see from this figure, they are rising rapidly. Um, and the current uh, trajectory that these, um, these concentrations are on are actually in line with one of the highest warming scenarios of the IPCC. Uh, so that would mean um, increased temperatures of more than three degrees Celsius by the end of this century. But something positive about methane is that it actually has a very short atmospheric lifespan. So it only sticks around in the atmosphere for about nine years once it's released. Um, if you compare this to carbon dioxide, which is more about 300 and upwards to 1,000 years that it stays in the atmosphere, um, it makes it actually a very good um, target for climate change mitigation because any uh, reductions or stabilizations that we can make in our emissions of methane, we would see that reflected in very quick decadal time spans in our atmospheric concentrations. 
So methane is very important in the, uh, the carbon budget of the Arctic. So we have a very large reserve of carbon, which is the building block of methane, uh, that's stored in the Arctic under what we call a cryospheric cap. Uh, so this is made up of permafrost and glaciers that maintain carbon uh, in a frozen state, preventing it from being released to the atmosphere. But it also acts as this cap or this seal that's um, containing or maintaining um, methane and carbon dioxide and preventing it from being released up to the atmosphere. So before I throw a bunch of arbitrary numbers at you, I will put in some context uh, and say that our current atmosphere has about 750 pentagrams of carbon. That doesn't need to mean too much to you, but at least we can compare it to some other numbers. We know that we have about 1300 pentagrams of carbon stored in our permafrost in the Arctic. That's double what we have in the atmosphere right now. Additionally, we have a very unknown, uncertain number, but potentially, potentially massive amount of carbon that's stored as methane hydrates in the deep permafrost. So this is um, methane that's stored in kind of like a cage of water molecules, which keeps it in this stable, uh, solid ice-like form. So you can see that a release of just a fraction of, of, of this carbon could potentially be quite catastrophic. Especially when you consider, as a couple other people have mentioned, that the war Arctic is warming two times faster than the rest of the world. Uh, and you can see how this creates a, a massive issue, this concept of a, a feedback loop where this cycle starts feeding itself. So as the atmosphere warms, it degrades and thaws the permafrost and the glaciers, allowing this release of methane, which then just perpetuates the cycle and continues to warm the atmosphere. Now we have scientific evidence that uh, destabilization of methane hydrates have caused or at least um, largely contributed to some large temperature increase increases in geological history. So one of the more notable examples of this is at the Paleo-Eocene uh, thermal maximum where we had rapid temperatures increase of um, six degrees in a very, very short time span. Additionally, uh, we believe that methane hydrates may have contributed to the extinction event at the Permian-Triassic boundary, uh, where it was one of the larger extinction events on Earth about 250 million years ago. So we have very high confidence that uh, carbon will be released from the permafrost in a warming world, but we have very low confidence in the time span or the quantities of this. And that's because um, permafrost is extremely seasonal as well as heterogeneous throughout the region that has permafrost. And so it's very difficult to uh, first quantify these emissions, but then also scale them up across the whole region. Um, additionally, it's quite difficult to get these measurements in many places throughout the Arctic. So it's still quite uncertain whether or not uh, permafrost can be considered uh, a, a tipping point in Earth's, um, in an, as a tipping point in the Earth system that we would reach this abrupt runaway climate change. Uh, and in fact, the scientific evidence actually suggests that we would see a more sustained, slower emission of carbon uh, as, as the world warms. And looking at, at emission estimates of, of about 18 pentagrams of carbon by the end of the century. So nothing too alarming. Um, I don't actually study permafrost. <laughs> I study a different uh, methane emission source in the Arctic. So what I want to point out with this is that while we don't think that permafrost is necessarily going to be this massive tipping point, um, there are many other mechanisms that are releasing uh, uh, methane in the Arctic due to climate-driven uh, glacial retreat and permafrost law. So we have all these other systems that are happening alongside this that we really don't know about um, and are not currently considered in our Earth system models or our projections for climate change. So what I um, study in particular is something called the proglacial spring. And I'll give you a little bit of background about what this is. You can see in this diagram that we have what I call the cryosphere cap on top. So this is where you have the permafrost and the glacier. Uh, this glacier is at its big, healthy extent. And that means that it actually has um, liquid water at the base of it. So it's 
putting water into the sediments below the glacier and creating this pressurized groundwater that's contained beneath this cryospheric cap. And then there are various processes happening um, that are putting methane into this water. So we have methanogenesis, which is a, the microbial production of methane where microbes are decomposing organic matter and releasing methane and that's being put into the water. But then we also have geologic methane. Um, so it's possible that as these glaciers advanced and surged over uh, various types of rock, shale, coal, um, sandstones, that they actually fractured the rock doing kind of like a natural fracking process where they created conduits in the rocks that allowed natural gas to migrate upwards and is now being put into this water. So if we move forward in time to kind of where we're at now, uh, these glaciers are retreating and the permafrost doesn't aggregate or develop fast enough to keep up with this glacial retreat. And you get this discontinuity or this hole in the cryospheric cap, allowing a pathway for this um, methane rich groundwater to be released. So we get these springs um, in the four fields of these glaciers. And if we continue further into the future, which is kind of where we're getting to now, where the glaciers just kind of flying back, really retreating and leaving a lot of exposed land where the permafrost is slowly developing in some cases and in some cases it's not, but it allows these groundwater systems to continue to exploit these pathways and to continue to release this methane directly to the atmosphere. Um, so this research is very early. There's very little research being done on these springs, especially in terms of uh, climate change and their methane emissions. And so unfortunately I don't have uh, a grand number for you to tell you how much methane is being put into the atmosphere due to these, but uh, it's, it's very likely that this is providing a considerable source of methane uh, to the Arctic and it could be a considerable part of the, um, the carbon budget in the Arctic. And then, I don't know if I have time, sure. I included a few slides kind of in the spirit of sitting in this uh, Arctic fieldwork tent. Um, just to kind of describe how we go about doing this research and how we get these measurements. And so uh, this is in the forefield of a glacier on Svalbard in the high Arctic in, uh, in Norway. And this is uh, where we have this proglacial spring. So in the middle of winter, the, the spring is still running. It's still, um, yeah, pressurized water is still coming out. But of course, it's very cold. And so that freezes very quickly. So you get these large... Um, Kind of ice uh, sheets in front of the glacier and the pressurized water creates something we call a blister so it um, raises up the ice and releases the water and so uh, this is a picture of us drilling into one of these blisters and that releases um well that's not going to work but uh it releases this pressurized groundwater and it it looks something like this and then we go about sampling it. And so our goal at first was to get a, a spatial study where we visited about 100 different glaciers on Svalbard and took samples of the water. So this gave us kind of like a, just a snapshot in time uh, of, the, of this water, give, allowing us to characterize these different springs uh, in, a, in a spatial manner. And then to get an idea of how much methane is being released over the course of a year so we can get some flux estimates or some emission rates. Uh, we have to go about more of a temporal study where we spend time looking just at one glacier and trying to understand uh, how much methane is coming out of this one glacier. So during the summer we spend uh, several months just kind of living at a glacier and taking regular samples to get an idea of what's happening over the entire melt season. And so to do that we do water sampling, um, where we can get some concentration measurements of how much methane is in the water. Bubble trapping, so a lot of these springs create big pools in the, in the summer and they have methane just bubbling up in them. Uh, so we make some very rudimentary contraptions where we can catch these bubbles and uh, get a good estimate of how much methane is coming up. We can also do something called the chamber measurement where we essentially just put a box over sediments and water and see how long it takes for methane to accumulate in this box and that gives us kind of a diffusive flux measurement of how much methane is just being released by sediments and by the water. 
And finally, it's important to understand if we want to really scale this up and get a, a measurement for a full year, we have to understand how much cycling is happening within 24 hours. So if there's any cyclicity in, in the a diurnal schedule. So uh, we'd spend some time also camping at the glacier and taking samples on a kind of like an hourly basis to get an idea if that's uh, things are changing between day and night. Um, yeah, so that's just a bit of background about how we actually do the field work, which uh, could be interesting. So that's all for me. Thank you very much, Gabby, and thanks for highlighting the methane release in the Arctic and the different aspects, you know, not just from the permafrost, but also these proglacial springs, which I'd actually never heard about before, before you told us about them. So really interesting to hear about that. Um, okay. So that was our final speaker for today. So we're going to be um, heading, heading over into the uh, question and answer session now. And I think we can see here on the Q&A box that we've already got lots of questions coming in from the remote audience, which is great. Thank you guys so much for asking us questions. I would also like to invite the in-person audience here in the room to please um, put your hand up if you would like to ask a question. And then we can, we can take, hopefully, uh, quite a few questions, uh, both from in-person and remote. I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take this microphone off here and I'll then you can pass it around for whoever's uh, answering. So, okay, um, let me just put this down so I can see my screen. So let's start with a question from the remote audience. Um, so we've got a question here from Rowan Sutton, who is asking, how robust is the reversibility of Arctic sea ice likely to be in higher resolution models that better resolve ocean eddies and boundary currents and the atmospheric boundary layer and potential circulation changes. So I'm, I'm guessing that this is maybe a question for <laughs> Louise or for Hamzin, but probably Louise. Uh, thanks for the question, um, <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I think um, when simpler models were used in the past, at that it was at that point when people used sort of low dimensional models that they weren't quite sure whether sea ice loss was reversible or not. But I think uh, now, like when people use um, the sort of present ge generation of climate models, it doesn't seem to matter too much what the resolution is, as far as my understanding of it. I should say I'm more of a paleo climate person than a future sea ice modeler, so with some caveats. But my understanding is that actually it doesn't really matter what the resolution is, providing it's a full three dimensional model with an up to date sea ice model. Uh, um, submodel within it, then I think it is reversible um, as to what the different trajectories are on the sort of the way up and down for carbon, then that's going to depend partly as well on the ocean model and other aspects of it as well. I had a bit of time. Yeah, Tamsin's got something to add there, yeah. Well, only just from the sort of AR6 chapter nine perspective, it was pretty emphatic um, that if you reverse the temperature, the warming, that the, the sea ice would regrow, and that would have included any of the high resolution models that were that were done in time for the AR6. So it, it was a pretty clear message, I think, of reversibility, uh, just to confirm that, yeah. Thank you both very much, and, and thanks for answering Rowan's question. So let's um, take another question here, unless there's any in-person questions. Okay, Emily, you've got a question. Go ahead. Oh, I'll need a Yes. Sorry, it is it's probably a question for Louise again, mainly, but well, but Tamsin might call, want to comment as well. But um, Louise, you were showing the um, DO events, and the you know in the past where there's been very um, dramatic temperature change over a very short time scale, um, which um, are largely due, I think, um, to uh, fresh water input into the North Atlantic, but you'll confirm whether or not that is the main driver. Um, uh, you highlighted significantly sea ice um, and, and sea ice melts, but of course there's also large amounts of ice um, on land, Greenland, and if you're talking about past climates, um, over North America. And I just wondered whether you could comment both in the past and in potentially in the future, where the biggest sources of that fresh water are currently thought to come from that could be drivers of significant rapid temperature change. Again, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, oh, you've lost it. I wasn't quite sure if you were also asking about future as well, or was that was more just, okay, 
Um, DO events are really um, interesting and a bit complicated, to be entirely honest. Right. So they, they seem to occur in sort of packages. So the, they, they, they occur, there's, um, the, the, they often occur in sets of maybe four or five, with the first one of those being the biggest. And the first one usually seems to be associated with changes and releases of, of fresh water. So we think there's, so some, some people have, have, have kind of subtermed these events as Heinrich kicked DO events for the first one. But then once you've had that, which is to do with the fre freshwater release, probably from the Laurentide ice sheet, which was a big ice sheet over North America, um, which obviously doesn't exist at the moment, um, then there they do seem to be quite at least quasi self-sustaining there's a lot of statisticians who argue about whether they're true oscillations or not uh i just call it quasi oscillations these days but um it seems to kind of get you around these things so that you don't have to have the freshwater release from a, the an ice sheet it looks like to have a do event but they are come in slightly different classes and then maybe like if the system settles down then maybe you need another freshwater event to, 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 to re-trigger them it, or it, it looks something like that um, most of the model simulations don't have that level of complexity and because it's hard to run the complicated um sort of uh, cmip6 type models for long enough because these take thousands of years often it's really hard to to spin up uh, a, a glacial climate which is adequate for simulating that and also we don't have adequate coupling between the ice sheets and the rest of the system or to be able to run at that length so we only sort of kind of half simulate these at the moment but the the you do need ocean feedbacks you must have light long enough for the ocean to build up heat and for there to be this sort of um freshwater layer which sort of kind of insulates the sea ice uh, the Halo climbing between the sea ice uh, and then this fresh cold layer of water and then a warmer saltier ocean underneath and then uh, once once the ocean underneath is has got enough heat built up in it then we don't know precisely what triggers them but at some point you basically have a massive venting of the heat and melt back of the sea ice i think people think you can't have that type of event in the present climate because mainly because actually co2 is too high so do events only seem to occur when the co2 in the atmosphere is between about 190 to 230 parts per million so only in relatively glacial climates i think it's a tiny bit less clear whether you have to have more ice sheets to have them happen or not um, they seem to be most likely to occur under intermediate, like uh, an intermediate amount of land ice, and it might be to do with changes in wind circulation. So you feedbacks in terms of winds and gyre and heat transport in the, the North Atlantic are also important. Um, but I mean, we can definitely learn a little bit for the, the future about um, how sensitive the ocean is to, to freshwater forcing and whether that's likely to trigger other types of um, abrupt climate change. It won't be a DO event, but it will. The, but some of the mechanisms involved could be at least partially similar in terms of the interactions between sea ice and the gyre and the, the other parts of the heat transport. That was probably very long, but it was a <laughs> no, long question. It was a long question, yes. Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, Tamsin, do you want to comment on that as well? Or? Well, I suppose I'd quite like to sort of make a broader point about um, many people will have heard of sort of the shutdown of the North Atlantic circulation, the Gulf Stream. Um, and I suppose uh, I'm almost wanting to make a slightly educational point, which is that often people think, perhaps especially if they watched uh, The Day After Tomorrow, the film a few years back, that this this is purely because of meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet. So this is the idea that it it weakens or potentially could even shut down the North Atlantic Ocean circulation because of the the extra fresh water going in. But actually, as I was just teaching my first year undergraduates at King's uh, Geography recently, um, the the Arctic sea ice melting um, and the extra rainfall we get at that sort of high northern Atlantic latitude and the warming of the ocean, all of those things actually are contributing to sort of changes in the in, it's actually the density of the water sinking uh, that sort of weakens that circulation. Um, so there's lots of factors, but uh, sort of a slight good news story is that AR6 has slightly reduced the, the projection for the collapse of that circulation this century. I can't remember the exact phrasing. I think it's unlikely to collapse this century with medium confidence, I think. 
Um, so that's it's not necessarily saying it's not going to, but it's a slightly less likely than than perhaps previously thought. But of course, next century, if we sustained high emissions, that would become increasingly likely. Yes, uh, thank you, Tamsin, for adding that. Were you adding wanted to add something as well, Michael? Or? No, no, okay. Um, okay, so I think we'll move on to another question here from um, from the remote audience, unless there's any. Uh, yeah, so um, there's a question here from Harriet, who's saying uh, a question for the panel, really. I'm um, reflecting on Michael Bravo's comments. How can social science be better integrated into the science of climate risk? And what lessons can be learned from the Arctic experience? Um, so I think I'll get, give that to you, Michael, first, but maybe the other panelists would want to comment on it as well. Thank you. It's a great question. It's a complicated one. <laughs> Without dodging the question, I'd, I'd want to take close, a closer look at the word integrated, because it tends to cover a host of sins. So what I'm thinking, I mean, is listening to the extraordinarily clear science and expertise operating across range of periodicities and temporalities across centuries. But I'm also aware that, you know, that socioeconomic systems operate on very different temporalities, right? Uh, the way in which societies and global markets respond, the sensitivity of societies and markets to change is, is very different. Now they're linked and coupled, but they're linked and coupled in complex ways. So, even if you know some of these changes are operating over fairly long time periods and acknowledging the importance of reversibility, the impact, coming back to my brief, the impact on the peoples of the Arctic and indeed low-lying islands in the Pacific and major cities is, is, in, is enormous and it's present. So it's interesting both to see the complexity of the science, but also the imminence of the climate emergency. So that's, that's the point from which I seek to answer, you know, try to construct an answer about integrating the social sciences. I guess my observation would be, what I notice in the last year or two among social scientists is I see new kinds of agendas in international conferences. Uh, two weeks ago in Germany, there was an important conference by archeologists on thinking about the future of archeology span um, in the wake of melting ice. I think, so uh, in a way, although it's good to have social scientists working in partnership, say with natural scientists, all for that, um, and we can always do more. In a way, the integration of social sciences is about trying to understand, fundamentally, it will come back to a question of good governance. And the question is, how do policymakers and politicians come to grips, I think, with the relationship between these really complex kinds of knowledge that we're hearing about today. I mean, they're not, they're not easy to understand in truth, right? We're all uh, specialists. And actually the social scientists, uh, let me be clear, are also specialists. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of uh, written in plain English, but not always. So I think the challenge is to focus on good governance. And I think the social sciences, all of them, including economists, including philosophers of ethics, including anthropologists, including historians, all have a role to play. Thank you, Michael. Um, any of the other panelists want to add to that? Or no? <laughs> okay. Um, I think we had a question there from Hannah in the audience. Um, I'll come and maybe just. I, just a follow-up question to what you were saying, because I'm also a social scientist and with a specialist in, in governance and transition studies. And when I sit and listen to all your work, I love science, absolutely love it. But when I sit and listen to this science as a social scientist and governance person, I think, great, there's nothing to panic about. Because the message that you're giving across to people who work in timeframes of two to three to five to 10 years time is that these effects won't happen for another hundred years. So what have we got to panic about? So I guess my question is, how does science, and maybe this is also a question for Cambridge Zero, and I'd be interested to hear what you're doing. What are the kinds of work that you're doing to bridge that communications gap, to, to demonstrate to people who work at different times zones and different time scales, the urgency of your work, and also what do we need to learn as people who work at this scale about 
about the science. I'll just Hands say in, yeah. um, a quick sort of comment on sea level rise. I suppose partly, I think for us here, the focus was the long term future. And I, I very much would like to emphasize that sea level rise is already happening and has already made coastal flooding much more likely just in the last few decades. Um, and I agree that we have to keep putting that that in and say that like, you know, extreme weather is already of many types is already more likely. Sea level rise is already making coastal flooding more likely. So it's not even next year, it's now, it's last year. Last year's changes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, it's an excellent point. As in, I, I think that's something that scientists generally struggle with. I, the only thing I would say is that like, I think abrupt climate change is one of the ways that scientists actually do connect best with people when they talk about these things. This is a really scary stuff that we actually don't know enough about. <laughs> like, as in, and we can't necessarily predict when things are happening. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure as as individuals whether we're always like, I mean, I'm not sure I'm the best person to talk about to some people about some of these things and convey that level. I mean, it's just what I do every day. It's my, my research, it's my job. So I probably don't think about it in quite the same way that someone who's thinking about climate change does. But I mean, I do think that tipping points are like one of the, the really key ways that actually you get you get across to people that it's, it could happen tomorrow and it is happening yesterday already in terms of a lot of it as well. I'll, I'll let Gabby go first and then Emily wants to add something as well, but yeah, Gabby, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll just add something very quickly. Um, it just, I think I agree completely that the, the tipping points are very important um, for getting this message across, but the problem is we also run the risk of kind of ringing the alarm bells too often or too soon. So if we talk too much about, um, you know, uh, this tipping point, this catastrophic event could happen and then it maybe doesn't happen when we predict it, then we also risk this idea that we're just being too alarmist or, um, so we kind of have to, um, yeah, we walk a fine line, I think, in that as well in our communication. Can I, can I just have one thing that I think is absolutely critical on the time scales here? So, um, the oceans and particularly the cryosphere do um, evolve over long time scales. That is just a fundamental part of the physics. But the critical point is that there's action that happens today, tomorrow, and over the next couple of years that determines the long term future of the oceans and the ice. So that is how the short term connects with the long term. Right, we've got a few more questions coming in here. Michael, did I see you wanting to comment on that question as well? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm actually really interested to keep the conversation going to hear more from the audience. Right. But I think just to comment quickly, the, the relationship of short time skills, whether it's, as Emily said, immediate actions and the long term consequences is crucial. But also, so are the changes right now taking place affecting reindeer herding. Uh, the, the, the viability of, of northern coastal communities. So in all sorts of ways, uh, one could read the work of the Climate Crisis Action Group and the relationship between uh, extreme weather events. So there's a lot now, and I think uh, inevitably in science, the question of time periodicities and temporalities is always complex. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Okay, we've got lots of questions coming in now. So I'll go for Sean first. I think your hand was up first. A uh, very, very brief answer. Uh, Michael, you mentioned good governance, uh, and I'm thinking about A, research, and B, actions. Uh, what constitutes good governance uh, in terms of different, depends on values, cultures, or backgrounds, and is that really in your thinking and in other people's thinking about actually what do we mean by good governance and how we move forward? Thank you, uh, Sean. I mean, that's a really excellent political question. I do remember when uh, Secretary Kerry was making this point, he stopped short on that particular occasion. Uh, he referred to weak governance and strong governance. I think uh, being a diplomat, it, it was left to us to infer. But I think it's also a real question for uh, likes of my colleagues in the social sciences is what constitutes, uh, what constitutes good governance. I mean, what I've emphasized today in a sh short period of time is the importance of collaboration and partnerships. Um, you're absolutely right, Sean, of course, about values, about ethics. Um, I think we can look around the world pretty 
readily and see examples that we wouldn't consider good governance, maybe others would. Uh, we can look maybe closer to home and have a, a spectrum of opinions on where we see good governance. So I don't think there's a magic solution, but I do think there's probably a consensus that robust institutions, democratic processes, consultation and collaboration are, are at, at the foreground, I, I think. And um, it's, you know, it's an excellent question, um, but it's not a simple one, is it? So thinking at COP, who's present at COP and who isn't, you know? Is that a sign of good governance to be present at COP if you are a world leader? And the answer generally is yes. Is it a sign of good governance or poor governance not to be present? Actually, it's a lot more complicated, isn't it, than that? So, um, so I think we have to continue to grapple with the big picture and to see, and this comes back to important work, I guess, about around the climate emergency and the negotiations, something I want to emphasize to my students. It's no good trying to understand the climate emergency by understanding, you know, I grew up in Canada, Canadian views of the climate change or the British view. This is a global issue. And we don't spend nearly enough time, I would maintain, understanding, for example, what people in, in India grow up thinking about the environment. You know, what, what drives uh, Prime Minister Modi's understanding of, of climate and likewise for China. So I think uh, good governance also, my parting point would be involves decentering our own sense that we know that the ground we stand upon is probably is, you know, the center of good governance. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay, question here from Isabel as well. Sorry, it's not really a question. It's coming back to some of the points about um, social sciences and, and communication. So I'm here um, uh, as a fundraiser, but in a previous life, I was an artist. Um, and um, uh, there are, and the arts are problematic, but Michael did mention them and, and they have a tendency in this country to operate as an elite space. So you have to be quite careful about how you operationalize them. But there are extraordinary plays and uh, pieces around um, Duncan Macmillan's lungs, which was the old Vic is a story about people deciding whether or not to have children in the light of the climate crisis. Um, there are bad examples. There's the day after tomorrow, which is, you know, not based on good science and doesn't look at good and doesn't look at good science. There's some amazing debate in Theatre London Road about society working out how to deal with um, the killing of prostitutes and sex workers and 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 the idea of using debate in theatre as a as a road to think about that. I think there's an interesting uh, there's not much time for scientists to participate with artists. There's not much money around to do it with, um, but that can be one of the routes that you think about how you affect and um, voice social change. Yeah, just to follow up on that point, um, the AHRC have a, have a film award that, that transfer, transfers research into kind of films. And, they also, and there's also uh, a dance program where PhD theses are transferred into contemporary dance, which is quite amazing. You know, so people bobbing up and down as graphs or, I mean, that, that sounds glib, but that, that type of thing, they sort of distill them all. It's, it's quite fascinating. I, I think you'll find reference to it on, on the AHRC uh, website. Well, I th thank you, you know, bringing the arts into it. Because, of course, we think about the arts rightly as being important vehicles of communication. But I want to go further. I mean, one of the reasons I like to do research with artists is that artists are often able and licensed to think uh, beyond the boundaries of where academic research takes place. And uh, I'm really committed now in my teaching to get my students, I'm a geography professor, to get my students absolutely to read science, right? Including those who aren't physical geographers should be reading science. But also, I don't know what you think about this. I want them to be reading fiction. So my uh, course this year, there's climate fiction. And I'm really taken by an argument made by the novelist Amitav Ghosh, uh, originally writes about the Sundarbans in Bangladesh, but he's a professor of literature in New York. He made the argument a few years ago that the, that the structure of the novel is inadequate for discussing climate change. And he tried to explain why that's the case, why the novel, because of the way it deals with, with kind of crises, 
puts them in the background. Said so, so novelists cannot, are not really in a good position um, to tackle climate change. And so I think now, interestingly, two things. One is he's changed his view. And uh, you notice that the, my reading list of climate fiction certainly seems to be growing in, si in spite of what he said. But, uh, but the point then I, I, I think about climate fiction and, and about these cultural forms, right, is they are, they do constitute our culture. They're not only reflections on our culture and good governance, actually they articulate it. They help us to think. So maybe uh, coming back also to the question about integrating the social sciences and natural sciences, it's also about where we look for this constellation of conversations uh, to under for self-understanding of where we are in the climate emergency and the arts has to be inside the tent. Thanks. Great, thank you, Michael, and, and thanks for the questions. Um, we're, we're kind of over time already, but I think love row that we are not under pressure to finish. Okay. Just relax and enjoy ourselves, right? So, if you, if anyone needs to rush to another event, we won't be offended if you run out. But we have a bit more time, and we've got a few more questions from the remote audience that I would like to try and get through. So, just unless you have to, if you have to go, do say. But yeah, um, there's a question here at the top of my screen about methane, actually, Gabby. So I think this one's kind of come to you. But do you think the the United States COP26 agreement on methane, which I think was made last week, will make a difference to the the risks that the polar regions are, are facing on on methane? Um, I guess the, my understanding is the agreement is reducing methane emissions, um, particularly looking at uh, the fossil fuel industry and um, looking at their, uh, like the, the whole process from the um, extracting the fossil fuels to the use and the pipelines and trying to mitigate some leaks and these kinds of things that we have in the infrastructure. Um, I guess uh, we do have quite a few pipelines that <laughs> run through the Arctic, and so certainly can um, help in terms of methane emissions in the Arctic. But actually, our our main methane emissions, at least our anthropogenic or human-induced methane emissions, actually come from not the fossil fuel industry. I mean, it, it is quite a large part, but um, most of it comes from agriculture and waste, so things like livestock and landfills. Um, but of course, in, in terms of the Arctic, that's not, uh, it's, it's probably more so from things like wetlands and, and these more natural um, emission sources. Okay, thank you. Oh, and time's in yet? Uh, just a brief thing, if, if anyone wants a, like a translation of the sort of temperature predictions for the methane pledge, um, I saw that the climate scientist Piers Forster uh, on Twitter had tweeted a, good, a really good thread about that. I think it was just yesterday. So that talks about these kind of, is it going to make 0.1 degree C of, of warming difference, 0.2? What are the uncertainties? So Piers Forster, uh, do have a look at his Twitter for, for, for more of the kind of quantitative side for that. Thanks, Tamsin, for highlighting that. Um, I've got another question here in the, from the remote audience from Adrian Temple Brown, which is uh, specifically about the IPCC summary for policymakers. So it might be coming to you, Tamsin, but he's, um, he's saying that he, he's referring to specific statements in the summary for policymakers, um, which he reads as indicating that, and I quote here, sufficient thermal energy is already committed to the oceans to melt both poles and that this change, the poles melting, is therefore irreversible. Is that a correct interpretation of, of the IPCC summary of policymakers? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I'd say sort of roughly half right. Um, so uh, there's a whole, I think it's B5 uh, in the summary for policymakers um, was actually the bit that I was involved with. And, and it definitely says we are committed to further ocean warming. So that's definitely the case from our past emissions. We are also committed to further retreat of the glaciers for decades to centuries. Uh, based on past warming and, and the past emissions, I'm um, sorry. Um, uh, we are committed to further sea level rise because of that ocean warming and therefore expansion of the ocean and the loss of the glaciers. Um, we uh, are virtually certain, as I said earlier, to lose more from the Greenland ice sheet. So that's a third aspect of sea level rise. Um, Antarctica, as I said, the picture is a bit less clear, um, but overall that means that we are committed to ocean warming, we're committed to glacier retreat, we are committed to sea level rise, and the statement for sea level rise is that it will stay elevated for hundreds to thousands of years. So uh, that's not the same as melting 
both ice sheets and all ice and snow in both poles. So that's why I said it was only half right. It's it's a partial loss, if you like. Um, but certainly we have committed to a lot of those changes uh, and that will lead to sea level rise staying high for hundreds to thousands of years. Thank you, Tamsin. Yeah, uh, thanks for answering that question. Um, another question here from Hilary Ray, also in the remote audience, uh, which is a little bit long, but I'm going to read it out. Um, saying, thank you all so much for thought-provoking, informative, and quite frankly, deeply alarming presentations. Given the information presented by Michael Bravo on these geographic areas, we still seem to know so little about them, particularly about the peoples and animals that inhabit them. Uh, this indicates to me a profound disconnect and perhaps goes to his point on governance and leadership. What do you think, uh, getting to the question now, what do you think would incentivize a deeper engagement by other countries to form a global community that is a genuinely interested in solving the climate emergency and where could the leadership come from as there does not appear to be a single agency that might be able to broker a social political or legislative solution that addresses the concerns of stakeholders including the indigenous peoples and young people who are facing the more severe effects of the climate emergency and uh yeah it's just interested in your reflections on on cop 26 as well sorry that was a bit long but michael <laughs> uh, to hillary's credit of course it's the question yes <laughs> Maybe that's almost enough to say that it is the question. I do think uh, there are answers, not a single answer. And I think that's what we're getting at too, right? We're trying to say in spite of the fact that we try to have definitive knowledge or knowledge where we uh, talk about certainty and uncertainty. In the end, when we're talking about developing good governance, we must be looking at a whole range of different civic movements on the ground. We must, so I don't think it'll happen in an organized way. For sure, we need a uh, good international leadership. We need multilateralism. We do need world leaders to want to talk to each other and to engage. Uh, we do need policy forums. So I think, you know, I can only say that that's the question, but there won't be one answer for good governance. There has to be a whole series of different initiatives. And that, where I think that question has, has particular force is that we know from philosophers that the issue of climate change for many members of the public is a source of paralysis. It's too complicated, so we shrug and don't do anything. And I think, I think the answer is rather that if we recognize that there's a multitude of different ways to be involved and to create international good governance, then that encourages the engagement that's needed. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else want to comment, Louise? Yeah? No? no? OK, sorry. <laughs> thought you were taking the mic there. Um, we've got a question from the man standing up there. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Benoit. I'm from Airbus. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And a question for you, perhaps. Um, I, uh, well, I do believe that uh, good citizenship and even exemplarity of big corporations also is key to playing a role. And innovation in that can add uh, value and bring solutions. What kind of solutions could be could could we add technologically speaking to monitoring the, the methane emissions on the Arctic? Is uh, Earth observation from space and satellite technology could help? Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, could we capture this uh, methane uh, that is bubbling uh, already there? Um, yeah, in terms of remote sensing, there's a lot of work going on, particularly in the Arctic, because it is such a difficult to access uh, location. Um, so in terms of monitoring permafrost and this sort of thing, there's a lot of, of um, uh, remote sensing for that. But it, additionally, um, like in terms of the actual work that I do, uh, we've, in order to just to attempt to try to scale up these emissions, because like I said, I, I can study one or two glaciers very, glaciers very intimately and I can get a snapshot in time of and characterize like a hundred different glaciers, but we're talking thousands and thousands of glaciers over the Arctic. And so I am looking at remote sensing to try to scale this up. Um, for example, uh, these springs that I study, as I mentioned, they run throughout the winter and so they create this big icing um, as it's running throughout the winter. And so that is something that we can detect uh, with satellite imagery. And so that's something I'm trying to use to try to get a, an idea of the size of icings across the Arctic and see if we can use that to attempt to scale up these emissions um, and better understand them. Uh, and then I'm trying to... Yeah, capturing the methane. Ah, uh, yes. 
Yeah, that's a, <laughs> um, a kind of a controversial topic, I think, um, because as you know, uh, the, the idea of um, extracting oil or drilling or doing fracking in the Arctic is extremely controversial. And um, we have had, like up on Svalbard, we've uh, drilled some very deep boreholes uh, just to try to understand the permafrost in kind of like a scientific uh, manner. And we've, from what's happened to the scientists that are doing this, they have actually released quite a lot of, of methane. And I mean, these have, they've capped these things, but they've tried to do um, estimates of how much, I guess, power or energy you could, you could create out of out of these emissions. And for example, like on Svalbard, they saw that maybe they could run our town of 2000 people uh, for about a year. So the efforts uh, and the infrastructure and the money and the destruction that you would have to put into extracting these kinds of um, natural gas reserves would just, yeah, far out, out um, oversee any like positive uh, or beneficial aspect to it. I think, yeah, he's asking about capturing that the methane oh, is being released, like, yeah. in turn, rather than it being released into the atmosphere. Is, is that a possibility? I see, so like the idea of flaring it, uh, burning it off into carbon dioxide instead of methane or capturing it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is a diffuse flux where it's just coming out of the sediments and being released diffusely to the atmosphere. Um, you have all this bubbling, but I mean, we're talking about extremely remote areas um, that are largely inaccessible. And um, I, I I can't imagine a way that it could happen, but yeah, we could get creative. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gabby. I think Sean wants to come in as well. Just pass it. I just to say that there is a session at four o'clock this afternoon on uh, methane removal from the atmosphere as well. So that might is an alternative approach. I've got a question though. Um, and that is, um, Hillary was quite, quite right, I think, uh, that it's been quite alarming this morning. Um, so Louise, I, a question for you and or Tamsin was, um, we're committed to these effects. And uh, you mentioned that you've done, there's some modeling which looked at the increase in insulation over the Arctic spring, which then led to, frankly, loss of sea ice in its entirety. Uh, has the converse uh, been investigated to find out what uh, decrease in insulation over the Arctic spring uh, might therefore lead to different effects. And I don't know whether there's been any modeling that looks at these sorts of affects uh, um, in terms of just looking at these specifically over the Arctic spring. Um, uh, in a sense, this is a lot of what we do when we do, um, we, we set up the climate models which are used for future projections and then we set them up for, for past circumstances. So we actually know really very well what the changes were in radiation forcing for the top of the atmosphere um, going back through time. It's a, it's a calculation about the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of the Sun and such like. So you can, you can, you can calculate that very accurately through time. So if you want to test your model for a past period, then you calculate what the orbital parameters are. In, in, in the case of what I was talking about earlier, it was for 127,000 years ago. And then I can put in precisely what those changes are. But that is also done, there's standardized simulations which are done with these models for different climate periods as well, where they're also set up where there's more or less um, in, um, uh, sunshine's insulation forcing on, on these models and it, it can be useful as well in just seeing whether they all predict the same thing or not. I'm not quite sure if your, your question was also partly about engineering or reducing. Yeah, in that case, I'm going to hand over to Tamsin. Um, but thank you. Uh, Tamsin, before, before you answer that, I might just add, there is a, actually a question on this, which I think is very related to the question from the remote audience as well. So Oliver Graves is asking, what are your feelings on marine cloud brightening right, yeah. as a preventative measure for Arctic yeah. sea ice loss? as proposed by the Climate Change Advisory Group. So I think that kind of goes in with this question. Yeah, and in fact, there's someone on the corner outside here talking about how we should be doing this, right? He's got a sort of a costume and a microphone yeah. saying all this. Um, I, I guess the point I think is really important to get across uh, is when it comes to climate, the climate, there are different types of warming and cooling. So when you warm or cool the, a particular part of the world, with different 
uh, methods uh, and from different factors, whether it's natural or human, they have different, very different consequences. So, for example, the last interglacial period where we have the changes in sun because of the earth tilting and things like this, that actually is one of the reasons it's quite hard to learn the lessons from the last interglacial to today, because that type of warming is very seasonal. It's like warm summers, and that's different to now where it's warm everything. And so actually our trying to learn about things like the green and the ice sheet, there's some limits to what we can learn because it's a different kind of warming. Similarly, the kind of thing we're talking about here where we either put particles into the atmosphere to try and reflect the sun, or we try and create bright clouds that reflect the sun, particularly over dark ocean areas and things. Again, these are things that have a different impact. So for example, particles in the atmosphere can disturb rain, uh, which will obviously have serious consequences, changing monsoons and things. If we, if we, even if we just put lovely fluffy clouds over the ocean, we don't yet know very well how that affects the, the general kind of, uh, the, the, how everything kind of circulates and again the rain partly because clouds are really difficult to do in, de in that detail in climate models so unfortunately it means that although we can have quite broad brush lessons of different types of warming and cooling from the past from volcanoes which put particles into the atmosphere um, from bright clouds that exist already and how that's going to change in the future unfortunately there's always limits to what we can know because it doesn't necessarily apply uh, to the general global warming. Does that help to answer your question? Uh, could I follow up uh, with, just with a question building on that? I mean, to what extent do you, do you think then that, that modeling uh, future uh, reversibility of carbon is, is viable? Is that something that your research teams are sort of capable of doing? Because um, as you say, there are different, different kinds of warming and cooling. Could you say a little bit more? Well, it, in, if anything, reversing CO2 in the atmosphere, reducing the concentrations is the only one that is the same because that's undoing the original problem. So exactly, that's a great point, is that actually removing carbon dioxide is the one thing that actually is reversing it um, and isn't introducing new things into the atmosphere and, and so on. Can you, can you gauge whether we're more or less sanguine about other, other kinds of cloud and whether that can be modeled? Oh, um, I mean, lots of people are quite positive. This idea of marine cloud brightening is um, chucking more of the sea salt uh, from the ocean into the sky to create, uh, to help create clouds because the cloud droplets, the water droplets condense. And lots of people are really positive about it because you're not introducing something new into the system. Um, but as I say, I, I still think that there's, there's, you know, you're going to have knock-on impacts that are quite hard to predict. So it's probably seen as, uh, one of the least worst ways we could imagine trying to modify the climate uh, but that never means that it's seen as a perfect and perfectly known and risk-free option either so uh. thank you um anyone else want to come in on that or no okay um oh one more question there from the audience <laughs> Uh, thank you um, for your talk. Just to go on to that and go back to kind of the thresholds about it. Um, I don't want to be alarmist, but if we kind of are reaching a tipping point, at what point do we say this is the last chance to, to make a change? Because you were talking about the marine ice sheet cliff instability. If you're saying that's irreversible, what, what can be done after that point? With Antarctica, not much. <laughs> You know, if we lose large chunks of Antarctica, it takes thousands to tens of thousands of years to grow back. It, it does grow back, but very, very, very slowly. But I think we have to not conflate that with the temperature, because I don't think anyone would say that we would reach a temperature point where there's a runaway greenhouse warming and we're suddenly Venus. You know, I, I think we have to get away from that binary thinking of temperature thresholds becoming runaway, because we do think that we can reverse temperature changes that naturally they tend to reverse over time through the carbon cycle taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So I, I think we have to take those things apart. It's, yes, the Antarctic ice sheet, very bad if we lose big chunks of that, can't undo temperature, potentially Arctic sea ice, extreme weather are things that could be undone over decades or 
many decades. Yeah. Maybe I just add one tiny thing, maybe partly from, from looking back in time. Like when, when we've lost ice sheets in the past, there's multiple small tipping points in them. So like you get to a point where you, you raise the sea level and you de destabilize a part of West Antarctica or a part of a previous ice sheet. And then that kind of goes into runaway retreat until usually it's grounded on land or something like that. And then you're kind of have a new stable point. So in the past, we can see there was lots of episodes of rather rapid sea level rise, and then it might pause for hundreds or thousands of years. And then another small threshold small depends what you consider small some kind of other threshold is breached and then it happens again so there's probably multiple um sort of ice volume and sea level related thresholds within the ice sheet systems even as they are now when there's less ice than there was in the past so there's not it's it's not one like okay thank you um tamsin and louise so i think we're, we need to kind of round off now there's one final question here from the remote audience that i just wanted to but I think it's, it's, it's a very quick one. It's from Adrian Temple Brown, who's just uh, commenting on the fact that to, to draw down the amount of, um, just this year's amount of, of CO2 that's been emitted uh, through carbon capture would require a, a huge amount of energy. And um, he's basically asking in terms of communication of climate risk, can the university's network convey the magnitude of the climate problem to our leaders so that they act today with numbers like this, which politicians can actually understand? So I, I mean, I might take it <laughs> exactly. That's I was just going to take a stab at that myself. But uh, Adrian, I mean, it's a great question. How do we get these kind of numbers across? How do we convey this message to our leaders? And that is exactly what the um, COP26 University Network is trying to do through events like this, through the Climate Risk Summit that we ran a month ago, through the uh, the briefing papers that we are writing around these topics, which are actually being presented. We're working together with the cabinet office directly that these kind of um, papers get presented directly to our leaders. So. We are trying our best and we've also got our uh, communicating climate risk toolkit that uh, I mentioned earlier, which you can find online and I will make sure the link of that is shared with all the um, people who um, attended online today. Okay, so I think we've actually got through all the questions from the remote audience and all the questions from the in person audience so thank you all very much to everyone who attended remotely and in person and thank you so much to the great um, panel of speakers we had today you have all been excellent and excellent presentations excellent answers to the question so and thank you for coming to cop to present your work um and that's it and thanks for tuning in everyone who was there remotely and bye for now <laughs> Cheers.